you, Kim, uh, and thank you to everyone who has had a part in our worship service so far this morning. Uh, Audrey, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, this morning, I do have some uh, visuals for uh, the sermon for people to follow along, uh, so I'm going to do that at this time. Uh, there, there's no audio or visual clips, so I don't have to uh, remember to uh, uh, optimize for that, thankfully. Uh, but our message today is the permanence of love, the permanence of love. And, um, and I thought this morning uh, that uh, this would be our concluding uh, sermon in a series of sermons, um, but the spirit blows as it pleases. And on Friday, I received an email from Dr. Manfred Brock, who wrote to me, he said, um, I noted from your mailings to the staff of grace with a copy to me that prior to my coming, uh, you're preaching a sermon series on 1 Corinthians 13, focusing on the various dimensions of love. He said, as a conclusion to your series, I've decided to focus on the relationship between faith, hope, and love in the Christian life. And so uh, uh, this week is not the conclusion of the series. Next week uh, will be with Dr. Brauch, and I trust you all will enjoy your time with him. I very much enjoyed my time with him when he was my New Testament seminary professor. As we begin this morning, just a reminder of where we have been as we talked about love. Our first week, we discovered that love is the sine qua non, sine qua non of the faithful life, meaning it is the absolute essential thing to living a faithful life. And then last week, we looked at the actions of love, that love is patient, that love is kind, that love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This week, we're looking at the theme of the permanence of love, the permanence of love. Now, yesterday, our Christ and Cultural Humility team, and you'll be learning more about this team in the coming weeks and months, they had an opportunity to listen to an interview with the fellow Philadelphia Baptist Association Church, which undertook a transformational process in the late 1990s. One of the members church shared in that recorded interview that we listened to, that the, at the beginning of this transformational process, he was shocked when young men, undergraduate and graduate students of the local university, when these young men said they were afraid to come to church, afraid to come to church. We might wonder, how could anyone be afraid to come to church? They were afraid, like this little boy is afraid in this picture. Well, in his commentary, Alan F. Johnson states, a very good reason. We Baptists are part often of an evangelical tradition. He says, today we face a crisis of love. He goes on to note the very different, many different ways that we face a crisis of love. Uh, some evangelicals say that they're the true conservatives and they're more faithful to scripture's authority and they have the right view of God and so on and so on. And he, he points out how uh, some individuals and organizations have taken it upon themselves to proclaim that they have the right view and others are wrong. And they do this without a trace of authentic Christian love. And so he says what's wrong is that we've displaced love from the center. And he notes that for the Apostle Paul, love must always take precedence over Christian's correctness and superiority of knowledge or skills. You see, Paul penned this great love chapter as the centerpiece of his letter to the church at Corinth, because the church at Corinth had forgotten the greatness and permanence of love. They had forgotten that love never fails. You see, some at Corinth had believed that the fullness of God's kingdom had come already. 
and they appointed to the spectacular and revelatory ministries of the spirit as evidence that they spoke in tongues and that they had words of prophecy and knowledge. Others took pride that the revealed knowledge to them and in, in the revealed knowledge to them and they sought status based on their gifts, based on their contributions and, and, and absent was a concern for the community. But in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul states they're lacking the character traits of humility and love. And so he writes, as we heard this morning, love never fails. The Greek word means to become invalid, to come to an end. You see, love never fails, Paul says, but about those gifts the Corinthians were taking so much pride in, he says that they will all cease. They will all come to an end. They are transitory. They are transitory. They are temporary. And this contrast reminds us that love should be more valued than anything else. Because these gifts that they were seeking to practice without love, they were nothing. Now, the gifts come to an end because currently in the present time, we know only in part. But then at the end of time, when Christ comes, when we meet God, we should know fully. When perfection comes, the imperfect disappears when the complete comes, the partial comes to an end. And the Apostle Paul illustrates this in three images. Three images he illustrates this point. From the movement from childhood to adulthood. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put childish ways behind me. And this image illustrates the two stages childhood and adulthood. Just as we pass from childhood into adulthood, the present age is a mere passing. It is incomplete. It is partial like childhood, but in the coming age, adulthood, there will be fullness of knowledge. Second, now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Corinth was known for its highly polished bronze mirrors. Now, they didn't give the same sharp image we see in our glass mirrors today, but they gave a fair reflected image. So our knowledge now is indirect. It's imperfect. But when we come to see God face to face, we will know fully. And then the third illustration. Now I know in part, then shall we know fully. This reminds us of that mark of humility. Knowing what we know and being aware of that which we don't know. You know, the more I, I learn in life, in my experience, my experience has been the more I learn, the more I no, the less I know. As I become more and more aware of other, other facts and histories and experiences of other people, I realize I actually know less than I think I know. Right? In the words of my favorite singer-songwriter, David Wilcox, he says, everything I think I know, I think. Everything I think I know, I think. Paul's great hymn ends with those words. Now these three abide, and I'm sure Dr. Brock next week will speak about the interrelationship between faith, hope, and love. But Paul says the greatest of these is love. And we can wonder and ponder why love is the greatest. I would like to point, love is the greatest because it is the very nature of God. First John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Love touches everything. 
faith and hope are important features, but love touches all. It is what binds a community together. And it's that love that will continue into the new age. This reminds me of a quote I read this past week as I was reading Tamara's book. It was from Fred Lewis's sermon shared with the congregation on August 23rd, 2020. Diana Butler Bass says that the church is not so much an institution, but a community of relationships where people's selves are with God and with one another and are bound by love. Another commentator reflects on this passage and says that if mountains come and go, but love endures, if love is greater even than faith and hope, then not only does our loving endure beyond us, but our loving is our legacy as well. As we celebrate the 150th anniversary of Grace Baptist Church, as we celebrate all that is part of our legacy, we remember that it's not only our legacy, but the legacy of 10th Baptist Church, the mother church, the church that had the vision to plant a mission in North Philadelphia. These young workers from 10th Baptist Church had contagious enthusiasm and interest grew from the beginning and the mission met a need, was born of a true sense of purpose and gained a lasting hold on the community. Love's permanence. Russell H. Conwell is perhaps best known for leading a church that founded a university and two hospitals and an orphanage. But according to one of his biographers, we're told that the congregation adored the larger than life man, not for the notoriety he brought the church, nor the magnificent Baptist temple building, nor for the crowds or the accolades he received, but it was for how he loved the people. The letters he wrote to them and from them show this love, love in action, love incarnate, love the essence of life, love a principle of all conduct. That is more than anything else, the secret of Conwell's success, said his biographer, love's permanence. Grace Baptist's legacy of love didn't end with Conwell. It continued forward through the people of grace, through the purchase of a camp, to the chapel of the four chaplains, memorial to the actions of four chaplains who gave up their lives for their brothers. Greater love, no greater love is this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Love's permanence. These are well-known stories, but they're not the only legacy of love. Listen to these words of one member who shared their story with Tamara. This member said, when I talk to some of my friends, they tell me they just go to church to go to church. But for us, it's a family. It's a group of people you've known a long time that care. I know my children are going to be loved. Love's permanence. Or the story of what brought Dr. Frederick Lewis to Grace Baptist. He said he recognized early on that there was a great openness in theological diversity in the congregation and not just one point of view. He would call it a big tent instead of a small tent. A big tent, one that provides an, for a number of different views and that's what attracted him to grace. He also went on to say that the church became a place for recovery and healing for those who had come from hurtful experiences, loves, permanence. Interfaith Hospitality Network, faith in action. We know these ministries well, and they are a legacy of love's permanence. As I read Tamara's book this past week, and the stories that I found within them, one of the things that struck me 
was the permanence and the legacy of those who have taught Sunday school. More than once it was mentioned, love's permanence. If you notice, this is a top 10 list. And the final one is the idea that grace is welcoming and accepting of people from different backgrounds. One member shares this story. They say, when we arrived at Grace, I don't believe there were very many Latino families there. We came from a different worship style, which you would have thought after visiting, we'd have said, no, this is not for me. But our priority was our children's spiritual care and finding Grace to be the place for our children. We found a place for us too. Grace is incredibly welcoming and accepting of people with different racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. And to me, this person said that always spoke volumes. To be in the community of Bluebell and still very accepting and welcoming is so wonderful. It's a church that's all about showing Christ's love, grace, and acceptance. And that has always moved me from the day I stepped in the doors of our church. Friends, another illustration of love's permanence. And so on this Sunday, as we begin our celebration of the legacy of the love in the past, the love in the present, the love that is in and around and among us, let us remember that these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. One of Dr. Conwell's favorite hymns was the old rugged cross. It's a beautiful hymn that speaks of God's love for us. And the invitation is for us to cling to that cross, to cling to God's love. I will often say that if we have a hard time loving our neighbors, that to overcome that challenge, one way to do so is to remember God's love for us, to remember God's love so that God's love might flow through us and flow out of us to our neighbors. You're invited to sing together our closing hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. So I'll cherish thee.